By definition, a storyteller conveys events in words, images, and sounds, often by improvisation or embellishment. The Living Bread Radio Network presents The Storytellers with Tony Agnesi. Today you'll hear a faith-based, inspirational story that's both heartfelt and heartwarming. And now, let's meet today's storyteller with Tony Agnesi. Hi, this is Tony Agnesi, and welcome to this edition of The Storytellers. We're heard every Tuesday at 2 p.m. here on the Living Bread Radio Network with a repeat on Sundays at 9 a.m. And the program is available as a podcast beginning immediately following the show at 2.30 p.m. on Tuesdays at thestorytellersradio.com. It's also available on all the places you get your podcast, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, YouTube, TuneIn Radio, and now also on Spotify. And it'll also be available later each week at breadboxmedia.com, the Catholic podcasting site. Our program is sponsored in part by catholicbook.net, and all of the books featured on the program are available through catholicbook.net. Each week on the show, we feature a guest and discuss not only their personal journey of faith and their ministries, but they share as authors, speakers, bloggers, or radio and television hosts, and today is no exception. Geraldine Guadagno is an author who started out uh, writing books for kids. Uh, That's really her passion. And she started with the St. Joseph story and Irene the Elephant. And then she's written a couple of books for grown-ups. One is called Five Steps to Facing Suffering and uh, another in 2016 called John of the Smiles. Jerry um, resides in Texas and... um, and uh, does her writing from there. Jerry, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tony. Glad to be here. I uh, wanted to talk to you a little bit about yourself first. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of interesting how people come about writing. You know, I have my unusual story of of uh, how I uh, started writing in my 60s. Uh, tell us a little bit. I know you were in the finance business, right? Um, yes, I, I was. Um, what, what happened was um, I, I really grew up loving stories, and um, soon enough, I wanted to write stories of my own, and my teachers in school encouraged me, and um, before I went to college, I took an aptitude test from the Institute of Children's Literature, uh, which is still in business today, and they accepted me as a student. But then I thought about doing it simultaneously with college, and I didn't think I would be able to do that. And also I found out that writers were starving artists. (laughs) That's true. And I had had a relationship with food for too long, so um, I couldn't see myself starving either. Mm -hmm. Um, I did take a journalism class in, in college and didn't really like it, you know, really knew that the creative writing was, was for me, Um, but I wasn't sure when I was going to be able to do it. So that dream of mine just got put on the back burner for a very long time. Something that you always wanted to do and and just kind of uh, eating, as you said, kind of took precedent and and (laughs) making a living and so forth. You grew up on the West Coast? I did. I did. Um, I was born and raised in California. Um, and, uh, you know, I kind of got a little lost in, in college about what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I took a year off and I worked and, um, that really cleared things up for me. I said, if I'm going to be in the business world, I better learn something about it. So I went back to college. I majored in business administration and had a concentration in finance. Mm -hmm. Um, And that opened doors for me with um, banks and private trust companies and um, uh, investment offices and places like that. So this childhood dream of yours to Uh to write got put on the back shelf. When did did you decide to reach back and put it uh, out front? Well, um, what happened was... um, I was I was in a job that I didn't like very much, and um, 
my husband, who is an accountant, um, sat down and figured out our our bills and said, and, and also at this time, um, my parents had gotten ill. And I'm an only child, so um, I was very concerned about helping them. And so my husband kind of looked at our income and expenses and told me that I didn't have to work if I didn't want to. And he thought it was a good idea so that I would be more available to my parents, Mm -hmm. Um, which is, gosh, such such a blessing, such a gift. Did the light light bulb also go off at the same time? It did. It did. Um, I thought to myself, I'm not getting any younger. (laughs) So I think I better try out that writing thing that I that I always wanted to do and uh, I was I guess I was in my early 40s at at that time mm-hmm. and, and so uh, I, I took the aptitude test again from the Institute of Children's Literature I passed again and um, I started learning really learning how to write that's great. And now you also moved from your native uh, California to Texas. I did. Um, yes, that was uh, almost 12 years ago now. Mm-hmm. And um, we live near San Antonio, which is uh, a very strong Catholic city. And um, I'm sure that some of my success is due in part to, to being in this area and having such a strong faith community around me. Well, let's talk about your own uh, faith journey, uh, uh, Jerry. Did you uh, grow up Catholic? I did. I did. Um, I was I was baptized and raised Catholic. I went to Catholic schools, um, and the the faith was not practiced very much in our home. Um, you know, other than maybe saying grace before meals. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what happened when I was in my, I guess, late teens, uh, early 20s, was that I pretty much left the faith. Um, I happened to encounter some people who did not know the Catholic Church very well, but had strong opinions about it. Um, and they convinced me that the church basically was 2,000 years behind the times and had, you know, nothing to say about today's world. Um, and so that that took me away for a while. Um, then I met uh, a man that I wanted to marry, and he was also Catholic, and our families wanted us married in the church. And so we did. We went through the whole process with our priest and engaged encounter and and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then later, uh, later we we had a child. We had a son, and um, that was when our relationship started to disintegrate. Um, unfortunately. You know, we had we had talked about this sacrificial love being required mm-hmm. um, before we got married, but um, we hadn't kept God in our marriage. And by the time, you know, we were trying to fix things, it it got to be too late. And uh, I, we got divorced, and then. Um, I had well. I, I need to backtrack just a little bit. Sure. When when we had our son, the moment I held him in my arms, God revealed Himself to me as my Father. And from then on, <laughs> I started coming back to my faith. That and was I the pivotal that, mo- that was the pivotal moment that it uh, was that brought you back. Uh, it was a pivotal moment, and I started coming back to my faith. Um, 
my husband, unfortunately, did not join me. And, um, you know, things just deteriorated and, and fell apart. Mm-hmm. Um, and then during the annulment process, I, um, I took a real hard look at my past life, at what our relationship had been based on, and realized how, how sinful my life had been. And uh, I gave myself a year of penance. And then um, found, I, I surrendered everything to God. And, I, and I, told, I told Jesus, I can't fix this. So you're going to have to. And not just for me, but for the sake of my son. And uh, gradually, gradually, things got better. Um, I, I actually attended a healing mass. And it was after that mass um, that things began to improve and our lives started to get happier and better. Uh, and eventually I met another Catholic man. I got my annulment. I met another Catholic man who was practicing his faith. He loved me. He loved my son. He understood about sacrifice. And we've been married for 16 years. And uh, we both have grown closer to God during that time. So it's really been a blessing. That is a blessing. And it's a story, you know, each story is unique and individual, but it's a story that many people have gone through. You know, in the Bible we read that the Lord will not test us beyond our means and that and that uh, he will offer us a way out and and uh, if we remain faithful to him and uh, you're kind of an example of that to to remain faithful through it and and the Lord gets us through these things Uh, if he gets you to it he gets you through it is the is the saying some people say and so at that point in time then um, we've 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 got things back together. You are, uh, you, you know, moving forward, and now you decided you're going to start writing. and And you always want to write children's uh, children's stories. How did that, how did you get started? And you know, for those people who might be interested in doing some writing, how does that all get started? Well, uh, I, I really recommend the Institute of Children's Literature because you take one on one instruction with a professional writer or editor, and um, they guide you through the entire process and even teach you how to look for markets for your work. Mm -hmm. Um, So those lessons and that individualized instruction really helped me a lot. And um, after I had finished my first course with them, I was searching the internet, and I found a children's writing contest for a Catholic magazine called Jesus is My Friend, uh, which was from Pauline Media and which, unfortunately, is no longer in print. Mm -hmm. But they had a Christmas writing contest, and um, one of their sisters had created two illustrations, and they wanted a story to go with it. And that reminded me of my very first writing assignment from the Institute of Children's Literature. So I said, well, I got to try this. And um, I wrote my story, I submitted it, and I won. <laughs> and so um, that's, that's how I became a, a writer. Mm-hmm. I just, I, I had that uh, initial success. And then just kept on going from there, kept writing. Geraldine Guadagno is my guest. Uh, she is an author and, and uh, writes both children's books and adult books. When we return on The Storytellers, I'm going to have Jerry talk about her adult books here. There are a couple of them that one is fascinating to me. It's called uh, John of the Smiles. And, and, uh, and another book she's written, which, uh, which may be of some help to some people uh, uh, as well, is a book on uh, suffering. And uh, we're going to be back with our guest, Geraldine. Gaudano, right after this.
CatholicBook.net is your source for all things Catholic. With a large selection of unique items, we are here to serve the Lord by serving you. Visit our local shop in Canton at St. Raphael Books and Gifts, 4365 Fulton Drive Northwest. We are your source for all things Catholic. CatholicBook.net, for 30 years, a commitment to service. This is Tony Agnesi, and welcome back to The Storytellers. My guest uh, today is author Geraldine Guardano, and Jerry lives in Texas and has written a number of books. We're going to talk about some of those books right now. Uh, Jerry, uh, when I first met you uh, a while back last uh, last fall, we were talking about this book, John of Smiles, and I was fascinated by the story. I, I guess the story was, was pretty uh, much in the news down in your area. I don't know that it made it here. Tell us a little bit about... John of Smiles and how you got involved with uh, with that and and ended up writing a book about it. Yes, it was a big story um, in San Antonio, but it also spread throughout Texas and throughout the United States and actually to Italy and some other parts of the world too. Eventually, mm-hmm. uh, and this was before the internet, so uh, it it really spread um, a lot by word of mouth too. Mm-hmm. But John was uh, a little boy living in Texas with his family, and um, they followed the spirituality of the the Focolare movement, uh, which is also known as the work of Mary, uh, which is a spirituality within the Catholic Church, and its charism is unity. And so John was growing up in this family, Uh, He had three older brothers, and um, he happened to develop a brain tumor, uh, and he became very ill. But throughout his illness, he displayed some remarkable qualities. How old was he at this time, Jerry? He was about four years old when he, yeah, when the brain tumor was discovered, and um he he had this exuberance and this smile that he almost never lost, um, even when he had to go through treatments, even when he wasn't feeling well. And he had a heart for others, and he would always pray for other people that he knew that were sick. Mm-hmm. Um, and this was without any prompting from his parents. Um, he just did that on his own. And there was really only like one instance that his parents could remember that John ever prayed for himself. Mm. Um, and he also developed a hunger for um, the sacraments. Um, his mom used to take him to daily Mass with her, you know, from the time that he was born. And... Um, he received uh, anointing of the sick uh, before his first uh, operation. And then afterward, um, he decided one day, when he was about, I think about five, that he was old enough to receive the Eucharist. And this was after he had been diagnosed as terminal, but his parents did not tell him. And, uh, you know, doctors, no one, no one ever mentioned to him that he was terminal. So he decided that he was old enough to receive the Eucharist, and they, uh, they took him to their parish priest, and, and actually the, the priest said to them, before they even mentioned it, would John like to to receive the Eucharist. And he gave John some instruction, you know, just very simple instruction about uh, what we receive when we receive communion, or rather who we receive. And uh, John understood. 
and so he was allowed to make his first Holy Communion uh, at, at a pretty young age. Wow. Mm-hmm. This sounds like a story that I'm going to need a box of tissue to read. <laughs> well, um, I mean, there are, there are some sad moments, um, but the story of John's life, there, there are many funny moments, too. Uh, there are moments when John is interacting with his brothers and they're playing and things get very silly and, you know, those, those types of, uh, of uh, moments that all kids have when they're playing around with each other. Mm-hmm. And, but beyond the sadness, John's story is, is very inspiring. You know, here's this little child who is going through more suffering than some adults might be able to handle, and yet never loses that love for others and that concern for others. And really he led a very holy life, I think. Um, And, I mean, to many people who know his story, he's a candidate for sainthood. Unfortunately, there's there's really no one who can put forward his cause. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, uh, the bishop at the time, unfortunately, passed away um, during the last couple of years um, and had dementia uh, also. Mm-hmm. So this is, John is an example of one of those saints known to God alone. Um, and like I said, his, his story, because he reached out to others, mm-hmm. his story kept spreading. People of other faiths prayed for him. Uh, people across the country prayed for him. Uh, and, then, and then eventually, because the Focolare movement is based in Italy, um, his story also spread uh, to Italy. And because the Focolare has members throughout the world, his story spread throughout throughout those members, too. Mm-hmm. John of the Smiles is the book. Geraldine Guadagno is my guest. Uh, Jerry, you wrote a book on suffering, too, and you just had talked about the suffering, you know, a, a young child going through what suffering one might find difficult even for an adult. And we talked about sacrificial love earlier in the show. Uh, how did the book Five Steps for Facing Suffering come about? Uh, well, um, my uh, one of my books, Irene the Elephant, uh, had already been published by New City Press of the Focolare, mm. and so I was in close contact with them, and they started a series of five-step books. They were just starting it, and they asked me what I thought about it, and would I be willing to. Uh, to try to write on one of the topics. And um, so I picked the easy one. I picked stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, not that I thought that I knew a lot, of, a lot about it, um, but I thought it kind of resonated with me. Mm-hmm. I thought that I could, you know, do some research and maybe, you know, open up this subject just a little bit. These five steps uh, that you outline in the book, um, give us a little sense of those and uh, what people might find in the book uh, with those five steps. Okay. Um, well, step one is, um, it, I, I call facing the why. You know, our, our first reaction when something, something bad happens to us or to someone else is why. Why me? Why, right. uh, why this? It, Mm -hmm. Exactly. Why me? Why this? Why my spouse? Why my child? You know, that that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, we we all wrestle with that question. And in a way, the answer, part of the answer is that we live in an imperfect world. Mm -hmm. You know, where these things, these things happen. You know, God never intended us to suffer. But unfortunately, 
you know, in a fallen world, it it happens. You also mentioned uh, as, uh, that we should recognize the presence of Jesus in people who suffer. That that to me uh, resonates. Yes, yes, um, that that is step two, um, and and this is based in part on uh, on the spirituality of the Focolare movement. Um, and Kiara Lubick was the founder, and she she said that Jesus actually became every type of suffering that we could possibly endure. He, he knew every type of human suffering because he was fully human. And so when we see a suffering person, we can see them as, Jesus who is suffering. Um, and when we suffer ourselves, we can see that that's a suffering that Jesus also took on and made his own. Mother Teresa was another another one who uh, who saw the face of, of Christ in mm. people who were suffering. Absolutely. And one of my favorite uh, Mother Teresa quotes is, uh, minister to the Jesus in front of you. And uh, yeah. she would see the face of Jesus in all of those that she uh, dealt with uh, on a daily basis. Exactly. Uh, J- Jerry, I, we're going to have to call that a tease for the book because, I mean, we have just, the time has just flown by. This has okay. been a, a fun uh, a bit, of, bit of time together. Um, you can uh, see Gerald, uh, Geraldine's books, uh, John of the Small. Miles, uh, suffer, uh, uh, Five Steps for Facing Suffering, and her children's books are wonderful, Irene the Elephant, uh, and you've got a couple of projects I know that you're working on uh, uh, with future books, and they, they sound terrific. Um, you can look her up on, on uh, uh, you know, Google her. She's got a wonderful website. My website is actually jerryguadagno.com. Ah, Jerry Guadagno, yes. not Geraldine. Jerry not Guadagno. Geraldine, it's, it's Jerry I don't know if I should change that one of these days. No, no, no. It's many, many less uh, uh, letters to type. If you type as badly as I do, you'll you'll realize that. Jerry, thank you for being with us. God bless you. Great God talking bless with you. you. Too. See you next week for our next edition of the Storytellers. Hope you've enjoyed today's edition of The Storytellers with Tony Agnesi, a production of the Living Bread Radio Network in Canton, Ohio. To learn more about today's storyteller, go to thestorytellersradio.com. There you can subscribe to the podcast and hear all of our past shows. And join us again next week at this same time for The Storytellers with Tony Agnesi.